The following is an interview with Professor of Comparative Religion and Hindu Studies at Oxford University, Gavin Flood. It deals primarily with his book, The Tantric Body, which explores tantrism's conception of bodily existence, the soteriological salvific function of the body as a means to attaining spiritual liberation, and the sorts of political arrangements that are justified thereby. Tantrism is a cross-cutting tradition. It's manifested in Buddhist as well as non-Buddhist contexts. There's a Vaishnava as well as a Shaiva Tantrism, the former considering Vishnu the supreme deity and the latter Shiva. The latter is more common. And there are dualistic as well as non-dual approaches to the Tantric tradition. We're going to deal with all of these as well as Western equivalents of Tantric conceptions. In particular, I would note that there is something deeply consonant about Proclus, certain late uh, Neoplatonic systems, and that of Abhinavagupta, the major Tantric sage, for example. Much of what Professor Milbank discussed uh, during my interview with him in episode 2 of Europos about involving the body, the physical technology in the liturgy, in the ritual, in the spiritual, has a tantric uh, equivalent. All right, let's get to it. In the tantric body, you write that the, the tantric conception of corporeality is both more conservative and yet less reified than the modern Western uh, conception. Could you elucidate on, on what you mean by that? Yes, certainly. Well, I think that, that idea came to me because um, Tantrism has come into the West, and indeed yoga, and it's a, uh, a mass industry now and so on. And it, I remember reading, looking in a phone book when I was working in the, in the USA, and uh, in the yellow pages there was a, somebody was advertising for your, your chakras to be rebalanced, I think, for a small fee, or fairly hefty fee, probably. And I, I got thinking about this. This has seemed to be a sort of a reification of, of a, a tantric idea, that, or, or indeed a yogic idea, that in the sources seems to be much less uh, reified, indeed not reified at all. So in the West, there seems to be a sort of literalism, or um, almost a sort of fundamentalism, really, that re re regarding the, uh, the chakra system that it is actually located physically within the body, in, uh, in the physical body in particular places. And so it seems to me that looking at the sources such as the Maitra Tantra uh, and other texts where you have this idea of the, what they call the subtle meditation, the Sukshmiya, the sukshmiya Dhyanam, uh, where you visualize the subtle body, you visualize these, these centers of power along a central axis, but it's intended as a system of visualization. Indeed, it's subtle. It's, it's not regarded as a physical process. It's not regarded as um, um, these centers are not, are not physical. They're not, they're not stula. They're, they're sukshma. They're subtle. And there are different variations in these visualization patterns. So the purpose of these visualizations is ultimately liberation or realization of a higher understanding or the realization that the, the body and the self are integrated within a total cosmos. So I thought that they were um, less reified than Western understandings of the chakra system because you have different systems, so you can visualize three systems or 36 levels, or daras, 36 um, supports within the body, um, or even three. And so there are different systems and the tantra seem fairly fluid with regard to these different visualization processes. Now, uh, that being, having been said, um, the, the traditions are also more conservative in the sense that you, um, you are uh, inducted or initiated within a certain tantric system, and so you, your practice is with regard to that, that single system. And so indeed, one, one text says that you shouldn't mix these different traditions and, and different systems in order for them to be effective. So if you're initiated into, say, a Shaiva system, you follow the prescriptions of a particular text or a particular tradition. So you'll be initiated by the master, by the guru, who will then teach you the methods and techniques 
that are encapsulated in a particular text, in a, in a particular tantra. So it's conservative in the sense that you, you don't make it up as you go along. It's not individualistic, uh, but is set within a, a tradition, and the tradition is one of master to disciple, uh, uh, and, and a teaching which goes back um, to the text and to, to well, it's not, sh not sure how far these, these traditions go back, but certainly to the um, 4th or 5th century um, CE. So, the, tri so the, the, the subtle, the visualization of the subtle body is, is both uh, conservative in the sense that you stick to the tradition and you do what the, what the tradition prescribes, but it's also less reified in contrast to the Western model in that the processes of, of visualization are, are varied and it seems to be are not intended as um, a, a physical, uh, the, the, the chakra system or the, or the support system, the Ardaras, are not intended to be physical, uh, located in the, in the physical body, but rather mapped onto the body through imagination and through um, visualization. I see. I, see. I th think that the, um, the, the reification begins to occur in the 19th century where you get the, the chakra system map being mapped on to anatomy and uh, Western, uh, Western med medicine. So you get a, 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 the traditional chakra system and indeed com mixed up with Ayurveda uh, and that's mapped onto medical um, uh, Western medicine. So you get interesting books and so on in the 19th century in Hindi and in Bengali, I think, that show the, the chakra system located in the body. So this, this, uh, this uh, process occurs, not, it's not only a kind of recent phenomenon, but I think it goes back to the 19th century. That mapping of the, the chakras, perhaps of, of cosmic categories, or of categories that make up the the cosmology of particular systems onto the body, that's really the the sort of um, operation of of tantric initiation. And is 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 that correct? It's a, it's a kind of correspondence between body and category that's that's occurring there. Yeah, I think that's exactly the case. It's a correspondence between the body and category, and the, the body is almost a, a vehicle or a means. Of uh, enlightenment, in a way, the, the body is the the uh, is the is the process. We we are, we are embodied creatures. So I think the um, the dualism is not, in the West. We have um, since uh, in modernity, we've lived with a, a dualism from Descartes in a way between mind and body. And at least some contemporary cognitive science, I think, I, I think maintains that dualism is almost um, a natural. A process of cognition, but um, leaving that aside, the, the, there is a dualism in the, in the tantric uh, systems, which is derived from Samkhya philosophy, you know, an ancient philosophy in, in India, which maintains that there's, there's a distinction between the, 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 the essence of the person, the purusha or the, the self, and matter or nature. But what we think of as mind is within nature, so the, the, what they call the, the higher mind, the buddhi, the, um, the, the mind as a, an organ, the manas, and so, uh, akin to the other five senses, and the, uh, center of, um, the center of the self, what you think of as yourself, the ahankara, the eye maker, or the ego, if you like, they're all within the realm of matter, and tantric cosmology absorbs this Swamkya system. It adds its own higher level. So the Shaiva system has ele has um, adds eleven levels or categories onto those uh, the twenty four Samkhya categories or twenty five including the self. Um, so sorry, I've lost my way of that with this. So the uh, yes the, the the body then is a is a is a process within nature within matter. Uh, and it's still a fundamental system in which the, the, the Samkhya, in the Samkhya system, the soul is trapped in matter, it's trapped in the body, it's a bit like Plotinus or something. And so 
Liberation is the separation of the soul from matter, or the realization that it's, it, is, it is distinct from matter. And the dualistic Shaiva systems uh, agree with more or less with that. Where, but whereas with Samkhya, you have a you have no God, it's an atheistic system, you just have self and matter. With the tantric Shaivism, you have self, matter, and God, or Shiva. And the purpose of, of life, of human life, is to realize the soul's separation uh, from matter and its uh, liberation in the, in the Shiva Loka. But that process of, of liberation is through the body, so there's a a respect and reverence for the body, if you like, as inherently divine, because it's a because it's an emanation of, of one of the the shaktis or the energies of God. But ultimately, in the end, you want to realize your your independence, your um, separation from the body, but your participation in the energies of of the divine in the in the shaktis of God. And how does that? that uh, transition take place? If I'm mapping the cosmos onto my body, how do I then shift to that which is beyond cosmos and body, to, to the power of Vasudeva, to the, the source of, of liberation, or the, the transcendent aspect of the divine? Yes, that's a good question, because there must be some transition point, because in, the, in, in their categories, you have these uh, in Shaiva Siddhanta, if I may st- speak about that system for a moment, that the, that's the core tantric Shaiva system. Uh, and there you have three realities called, um, as I said before, God, soul, and matter. They're called um, Pati, the, like the shepherd, the, the lord, um, Pashu, the beast, the cow, and um, Pasha, the bond or the rope that ties the the beast. So these are the three distinct ontological categories. So there is a distinction between um, Pasha, bond, and Pashu, creature, uh, or soul. Now, uh, at, it's, 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 it's kind of easier to understand the, the separation of, of, the, of the beast from the bond, that's the cutting of the bonds with, with matter, uh, through a ritual process. But then what happens? What is, what, if it's liberation from that bondage, what is it liberation to? And that liberation is to become like Shiva, Shiva Tva, like Shiva, but not uh, merging with Shiva in this dualistic system. And so you become like Shiva, I think, because that is enabled, because you and the creation are still part of the energies, the shaktis of Shiva. So in a sense, Shiva is the only reality in the universe, but there's a transcendent element in Shiva which you can never access. But you can only access the um, the shaktis, if you like, or the powers of Shiva. And so when you become equal to Shiva, you, um, you realize that you are, in, in one sense, identical to Shiva, but you're uh, you don't merge with Shiva. You, 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 um, your qualities are identical to those of Shiva, but you don't participate in um, in his being, if you like. You're you're a distinct entity. Uh, in a, a sort of a, a corollary to this is that Shiva has five functions, five five powers. He has the power of creation. He creates the universe over and over again. He maintains the universe, and he destroys the universe. Those three fundamental energies or powers of Shiva, creation, maintenance, and destruction. And we as human beings, and we as as beings like with the potential to be like Shiva, have those powers as well in our ordinary lives. Shiva has two further functions. He reveals himself through grace, and he conceals himself through emanation uh, and trapping the soul in matter. And these five functions are also recapitulated in each individual person. So we have these five functions in a lesser way. Now when the soul becomes liberated, it becomes equal to Shiva, but it does not have the, um, it doesn't have the, it doesn't, um, 
enact the, five, the, the function of creation, maintenance and destruction of the universe. Only, only the supreme Shiva does that. So, so um, when we're liberated, we don't create and maintain our own universes. We, we, we just maintain our identity with Shiva um, and are equal to him. Shiva Tulya, equality with Shiva. Okay, now that's uh, fairly complicated, I suppose, but on, that's that's the Shaiva Siddhanta. That's the fundamental dualist system of uh, the tantric tradition. Now, on top of this is overlaid another system called non-dualism of Abhinavagupta and other uh, thinkers, particularly Kshema Raja, who maintain that actually, no, the Shaiva Siddhanta model is mistaken, because in reality, there is only one reality, which is Shiva. And I identify this reality with pure consciousness. And when I become liberated, I become identical to Shiva. So in that system, you have emerging. The transition is not so much a transition, but a recognition, a pratyabhigna, a recognition or realization that you indeed are not distinct from consciousness, are not distinct from Shiva, and never were. So in a sense, the... Um, liberation is recognition or realization of your identity with that absolute consciousness. And so that transition occurs through a sudden kind of gestalt, a sudden recognition, rather than, um, rather than through a ritual process in, in which you cleanse the soul of its um, coverings, of, it, of, of the coverings of matter. And is the ritual aspect of the tradition maintained nonetheless? In other words, even though it isn't the, the locus necessarily of, of realization, um, does Abhinavagupta and the non-dualistic approach to, to Tantrism, does it maintain the, the importance of external rights, if nothing else, for, for social reasons? Yes, indeed it does, and that's very interesting. The, uh, liberation comes through cognition, through re recognition of the identity of the self with the absolute, but nevertheless, you should maintain your your rights and your your ritual obligations to to family and so on and to caste. And that's an interesting idea because um, on the one hand, um, there is liberation, which is identity, which is uh, merging with this absolute power, absolute consciousness. But on the other hand. There's the Brahmanical Vedic adherence to caste and stage of life and to social stability. And Abhinavagupta, as a tantric householder in Kashmir, seems to want to maintain adherence to those um, social stability. And yet he still insists that you, uh, you um, maintain your, your tantric rights even though you're a, a Vedic, Brahmanical, respectable householder. Uh, and that means you have to perform um, erotic worship at least once a year um, in a certain ritual context. So there's one famous phrase. He said, you're, um, I can't remember precisely what it is, but that you're, you're externally you abide by Vedic rituals. Internally, you're, you abide by the, your private Shaiva of obligations, but esoterically, internally, you are um, you abide by the traditions of the goddess, the Kaula traditions, which demand transgression. So you're transgressive, but only on certain days of the year. The uh, rest of the time, you maintain your Vedic values. Having said that, there were tantric groups who rejected that model, who were transgressive through and through. Who were living on the edges of society and um, who maintained um, metaphysical non dualism and also ritual non dualism. Now, ritual non dualism is the rejection of any distinction between pure substances used in ritual and impure substances. Now, Abhinavagupta indeed maintains this, and so you must maintain non dualism uh, at certain times of the year ritually, but while metaphysically you're always a non dualist. Ritually, you, you, you maintain non-dualism at certain, certain junctures of the year. Now, for others, like the Karpalikas, the skull bearers, um, who are regarded as impure by the orthodox Brahmins, 
you maintain ritual non purity uh, throughout the year as well through for example covering yourself in the in the ashes from the cremation grounds rather than cow dung ash which is pure so the cremation ground ash is impure so you court impurity in order to gain power and in the belief that power will, will not only give you powers but also in the end result in liberation for you from the cycle of reincarnation and what is the political consequence of, of this sort of uh, tantrism? I would assume that Abhinavagupta's tantrism is far more palatable to a political order. But what does it crystallize as in terms of the history of India? What, what structure does the polity adopt when tantrism becomes dominant or at least becomes professed by the, by the monarchy or by the ruling order? Yes, that's a very interesting Question. Certainly, um, Abhinavagupta would be supported uh, and have patronage from rich aristocrats or even the kings of, of Kashmir. And patronage was terribly important for the tantric traditions. Now, there's an interesting, um, I think he's 8th or 9th century, Jayanta Bhatta was a playwright who wrote a very uh, very amusing play, it's still funny today, called Much Ado About Religion, translated as that. The Agamadumbra, much ado about scripture or much ado about religion. And he also wrote a book um, called The Bouquet of the Flowers of Logic, the Nyaya Manjuri. And in that book, which he says he wrote in prison, he was in prison for some reason, we don't know why. But he is worried about the influence of these tantric traditions on the king and on the society of, of Kashmir of his, of his time. For example, there was one sect called the Nilambaras, the, the, the blue-clad sect, who, he says, um, committed a sexual congress in public, much to the consternation and shock and horror of the, uh, of the ordinary people and the Brahmins. Um, now, so he was, he was worried about these transgressive traditions because they were eroding the uh, polity and the society of his time. So it was obviously a concern that that, that period but in a way, his, um, his worries were, um, were kind of ignored because uh, tantric traditions were taken on board by the king's royal kings uh, throughout, the, the, throughout the subcontinent uh, during what Alexis Sanderson calls the Shaiva period from about the 5th century to the 13th century. So this was obviously troubling for the orthodox Brahmins who um, who rejected these transgressive traditions, but they were attractive to the kings because they they professed power and and the kings were interested in power, and also they were easy in the sense that um, if you're a king, you don't have to go through an elaborate process of, of of initiation and so on. You can go through a simple process of initiation, but nevertheless get all the benefits of initiation through this simple uh, initiati initiatory process. One example of this, um, of the influence and importance of Tantrism is in, in Nepal. A text that I've been doing some work on called the Nature Tantra, the, the I Tantra, was probably composed in Kashmir in the 7th or 8th century, but it was transmitted into uh, Nepal uh, at the beginning of the 13th century. In fact, the, the earliest manuscript we have was composed, uh, was, was, sorry, was, not composed, was, was copied in 1200 CE. We know the precise date. And it was copied for a king of Kashmir, of, of, of Nepal, copied for that king who was unwell. And so this was a sort of magical act for the purpose of of the uh, benefit of the king and for his health, and it would be written down, and th the contents of it would be enacted to get the king better, and also for the protection of the king and his family, and also for the prosperity of the king, and thereby the prosperity of the kingdom, because there's an organic relationship, in a sense, between the king and the kingdom. The king is a manifestation of the god, of the deity, and um, as in the laws of Manu, so kings, Hindu kings, Deva, 
are gods. And the word for god is deva, and the word for king is deva. Um, so these tantric kings were interested in, in absorbing the power of these texts to maintain their, their power and to protect the family of the king and also the kingdom. So the, the nature tantra, for example, in what's called the, the gross visualization, the gross meditation, prescribes various uh, rituals uh, for protecting the king and for getting the, the, the king and his family back to health, particularly the recitation of the, the nature mantra, the, the eye of Shiva mantra, Om Jum Sa in the shorter version, which has these protective properties for the king and the kingdom. I'm very interested in this idea of the king as embodying or, or his body being linked to the health of the kingdom. Um, and it occurs in medieval Europe as well. More or less, my understanding is that when a king is sort of presented as parallel or, or analogous to Christ, it's because he's conceived of as dying to himself and then being the incarnate kingdom, the incarnate realm that, that he happens to reign um, over. Is there anything like that in terms of justifying kingship as embodiment of, of the realm in Tantrism, maybe linked to the notion of the cosmic man who's sort of dismembered, but then his body is the cosmos because it's made out of his parts? Uh, yes, I think that's exactly correct. In um, that, that book by um, Kantonovich, The King's Two Bodies, he talks about the two, in medieval Europe, the, the, the two bodies of the king. Uh, the physical body and then the body which is also the state as it were and the link between the people and the and that second body and that's directly paralleled i think in the tantric kingship where the uh, the, the body of the king is a divine body uh, and it and it's linked to the to the um prosperity of the kingdom so if the king is somehow corrupt or morally corrupt um well, they probably most of them were in some sense. But if the, if, if the king is perceived to be corrupt, uh, if there's something wrong with the kingdom, it's perceived because there's something wrong with the king. So if there's a drought or if there's a, a famine, uh, it's, it's because uh, there's a fault at the top of the tree, as it were, because the king is somehow in error. So there is this idea of an organic link between the king and the kingdom uh, and the, 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 the king is the linchpin, if you like, the, 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 the medium between the divine realm and the human social realm. Um, because he embodies the qualities of the god, but he also uh, articulates the, the, the needs of the kingdom itself. So I think the king is, is pivotal in this and, and, and is in some ways akin to the, to the medieval king in, in Europe. And um, it is linked also to the Purusha Sukta, the hymn that you refer to in the Rig Veda, where the, the universe is conceptualized as a cosmic man, uh, with, with the stars coming out of the cosmic man's forehead, um, the Brahmins, the highest caste coming out of his mouth, the, the, the speech of society, the warriors, the Kshatriyas coming out of his shoulders, the strength of society, the commoners the Vaishyas coming from his thighs, the support of society, and the serfs or the servants, the Shudras, coming out of the soles of his feet, who are um, the servants of the, of the other groups. Now, this, uh, that's a very interesting hint, because there you have the physical universe and the, and the social universe coming from the same body. The sacrifice of this cosmic man produces both the social body and the cosmic body. And so society is organically linked to the cosmos. And that idea carries on through into Tantrism, where the structure of society is linked to the structure of the cosmos. Now, with Tantric kingship, you obviously get um, a, a desire to maintain social hierarchy, to desire the um, maintenance of the status quo and the power of the king over the populace. But at the same time, you do get this transgressive dimension in the tantric tradition, from the Karpalikas and the, and the um, Shakta or the, the goddess-oriented traditions, 
which seem to, well, they're transgressive, but they also seem to be socially transgressive in some way in rejecting the power of the king and rejecting the power of um, the nobility or the, the, the rejecting the power of the Brahmins, but also of the of the um, of the Kshatriya class, perhaps. So I, I think you have a, a sort of some tension within the, the tantric tradition. On the one hand, they are conformist and supporting the status quo of kingship, but on the other, there are elements within them which are indeed transgressive and socially transgressive, which questions the status quo. Indeed. Um, in terms of the social body and the cosmic body or, or the structure of the world, both having the same origin or, or both corresponding to the blueprint, so to speak, of, of that cosmic man's body. What about the structure of humanity as a culturally, linguistically diverse entity? Um, in the biblical tradition, it's, it's ambiguous whether cultural difference, especially language, is, is to be regarded negatively, as in the Tower of Babel, perhaps, or positively, as in Pentecost. Does Tantrism provide any account of that? I'm, I'm thinking specifically of a quote that you provide in the Tantric body from David White, I think, where he talks about goddesses of clans and land underlying the Southeast Asian Tantric um, monarchical order. Is, is that idea, does that function to justify political particularity, cultural particularity, or does Tantrism tend towards unifying and homogenizing uh, different polities? I, I think on the one hand, you do have these clans and these lineages which are particular, and the, the kings would identify themselves with particular lineages. So the, the, the kings of Nepal, right up until uh, or until about whenever, it's about 10 years ago, I think, would identify with the uh, um, uh, Gushya Kali uh, lineage and tradition. So it's particular in that sense, uh, and yet it's also shared in that they would believe that all these different lineages emanate from the same from the same cosmic source, from the same goddess, from the one goddess who refracts, as it were, into these different lineages, these five lineages of, of these traditions. Um, now. It, I think that generally the tantric traditions would linguistically would, would maintain that Sanskrit is a sacred language, as as the as the Brahmanical Vedic tradition did. So the um, vernacular languages would be for um, just ordinary human transaction, but the the sacred language in which the tantras are written is. The, the, is the language of the gods. Now, interestingly, many of these tantras are written in not very good Sanskrit or ungrammatical Sanskrit. And they call this Aisha, divine language. Aisha is from the word Isha, which means Lord or God. So the Aisha language of the tantras, uh, Dominic Goodall, I think, suggests that the commentators on these texts were sometimes perhaps slightly embarrassed by the bad uh, grammatical formations. But um, in that idea of the Aisha language, you have the, the sacred language of the gods is still Sanskrit, even if it's uh, even if it challenges correct or traditional grammatical Sanskrit. So um, yes, on the one hand, there's, there is the idea of the particularity of lineage, but on the other, there is the idea that all these lineages are related back to a divine source, which is the divine word, Vaj, um, and that goddess, Vaj, is indeed the, the goddess of speech, and that, and that speech is the divine speech of Sanskrit. Now, in, in Tantrism, stepping back more towards the, the metaphysics again, uh, the 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 world is real is is my understanding at least um for for most of the tradition maya is not conceived of as illusory um and yet some would argue i think have argued that abhinavagupta's monism or not monism non-dualism 
would render the world somehow not quite real. Phenomena sort of occur on the surface of of the divine will, but it's not really going on. There's a, there's a profounder sense ontologically in which none of that is actually unfolding. What is the account of, of tantrism uh, for the world, for Maya, for the reality of Maya? That's, a, a, again, a very interesting question. I think for dualistic tantra, that it's, it's not much of a problem because the world is, is, uh, is real, indeed. It's an emanation of, uh, of, of a higher level, of, a higher power of Shakti. So the, 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 the idea is that the universe is a hierarchy from, that moves from, from Bindu, from the drop, to, to the gross world that we experience, the physical world that we experience. And so there's an, uh, an emanation from the drop, from the Bindu, through different levels of, um, of subtlety until you get the gross world. So it's an unfolding of um, or a coagulation, a coagulation of power or energy or consciousness into the world that we experience. Now it's um, so, so in dualistic tantra, that's that's fairly fairly clear. But if you maintain a, a non-dualistic tantra, as Abhi Navagupta does, where the world is there's only one reality in the universe, and that is consciousness. Uh, how do you account for the diversity of the world? Um, and that is a, a, a problematic issue, I think, for non-dualistic uh, tantrism. Now, Abhinavagupta doesn't maintain that the world is maya, is, is illusion. Um, that word is used in, in the tantric tradition as a level of cosmological unfoldment. But rather, that the world is consciousness. So I think there's a distinction between the Advaita position, the, the, the non-dual Advaita position, the, uh, which, which is um, that the world is illusory, and once you realize your identity with the absolute, the illusion somehow disappears. Uh, there's a contrast between that view and Abhinavagupta's view, which is that the, the world is, is non-dual, non that the truth of the world is pure consciousness, chit or chaitanya, and that you have to recognize your identification with that, Pratyavigna, your identification, your recognition of your identity with that absolute reality. But the world is not illusory in the sense that you see the world as consciousness. So I think there's a difference between the world being illusion and seeing the world as consciousness. So liberation uh, in Abhinavagupta is kind of waking up to the realization that the world is this absolute power or this absolute consciousness. So I think that's a, dis a distinct position to the uh, Advaita view. And indeed, that goes with a non-denigration of the senses. So Abhinavagupta, for example, in his writing, often draws parallels from, from the senses. So um, in his last great work, which is commentary on the uh, Ishvara Pratyabhigna uh, Karikas, the, the verses on the recognition of the Lord, um, he talks about the, uh, um, the, the the world being a bit like a painting on a wall. Now, is that an illusion or is that real? It's it's a difficult question. But um, he draws from the from the he, he draws uh, the, the painting on the wall is like a beautiful woman, and so you have to recognize the the reality of the world to be shiva as um, but it's it's a bit like a it's, uh, the world we experience is a bit like a uh, like the painting on the wall but it's nevertheless not unreal it is a, a real painting it is a real image but it, it's its essence is is pure shakti pure energy or pure consciousness um perhaps i didn't express that very well but the i think what abhi navagotri is getting at is that the world is indeed real and we have to um, enjoy the senses, but we have to recognize them as as consciousness, as Shiva, as Bhairava. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And using that image of, of a beautiful woman or a, 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 a femininity, um, Shakti is, in any case, real, and yet is also the divine agent by way of which appearance and phenomena come into um, come into experience, if, if I'm correct. 
why is femininity the the source or the 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 power that the tantric practitioner and even the tantric king has to draw on in order to act or in order to attain initiation and then act in accordance with um tantrism in accordance with with the tradition what is that what is that role of femininity in 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 the cosmology and, and in practice in, in the tantric tradition uh, yes again an interesting question uh, again i'll begin with the, the more conservative or the shiva siddhanta tradition which is the mainstream tantric tradition at that period where femininity or the female energy is, is relegated to a second place. So the main god there, Sadashiva, the main form of Shiva who is worshipped, Sadashiva, is on his own. He is, he is um, consortless. Um, but as we move into the more non-dualistic traditions, Shiva becomes um, embodied with his, with his consort. So I mentioned the nature tantra earlier. There you get Ananda Bhairava, who is the main form of Shiva, with Ananda Bhairavi, his consort, um, and they're iconographically depicted together. They're not in union, not in sexual union, but they are uh, slight, he, she is sitting on his lap. Uh, now, when we get to Buddhist Tantrism, the, uh, the deities are iconographically represented as in sexual union, as we see in these many tankas, that you, well, you can go into a shop and buy them, you know, they're, they're fairly popular, these uh, is this iconographic representations. Now, um, and in pure Shakta Tantrism, where the goddess is supreme, there is no male deity around. It's just pure uh, uh, pure female power, Shakti. Now, um, where that comes from, I, it's, it's, I think that the transgressive dimensions of, um, of Tantrism come from the Shakta tradition which I think is an independent, my, my colleague, and also, well, Alexis thinks, um, speaks now of the Kula Marga, the path of the, of the, of the family of goddesses, the Kula, the Kaula path. And my, my colleague, Bjarna Olsen, argues for um, an independent uh, goddess tradition, Shanta tradition, which enters into uh, the Shaiva tradition uh, and enters into Tantrism. And I think that's probably correct. Now where this goddess tradition comes from is an interesting question. Does it come from uh, lower caste practices? It could well do. And it could be a more sort of existential uh, thing here that you can't have a religion of pure masculinity, if you like, uh, that human experience needs a um, uh, needs, needs a female dimension as well as a male dimension. Now, in, in Tantrism, it's not, it's, it's not um, a constructivist view of gender. It's, uh, it's not, um, you, you know, in, in, in general social theory, gender studies uh, these days, there's the, an idea that, that gender is, is largely socially constructed, I mean, uh, with Judith Butler and so on. Uh, now, despite the, the sophistication of some of that work, the Tantric tradition is not like that. It, it, it thinks that gender uh, is a, if you like, a biological or a natural category, that there is a natural distinction between the male Shiva and the female Shakti. And that both in the, in the non-dual tantra, both are required for, for liberation. And indeed, in the transgressive tantra, it's the, it's the female dimension which has dominance over the, over the male dimension. Indeed, in, in terms of um, of the gods that tantrism brings into its account, and and how perhaps it differs from other traditions, earlier articulations of of those gods, is there something about Shiva that particularly draws the, the tantric tradition in? Because I think most people will think of Kashmiri Shaivism and of Abhinavagupta when they think of, of Tantrism. It was reading your book that I became aware of the Pancharatra and the fact that Vaishnava uh, Tantrism is also significant. But is there something about Shiva that would be more in line with, and perhaps the, obviously the Shiva Shakti pairing, more in line with Tantric metaphysics than, than Vishnu or Vishnu as usually regarded? Yes, yeah, I 
think that my own view is that there there is indeed uh, uh, something distinctive about Shiva. I think my colleagues might not agree with me, but uh, so speaking in general terms, if you remember, there was a Ruth Benedict wrote a wrote a book called Patterns of Culture in which she distinguished between Apollonian cultures and Dionysian cultures, so between Apollo and Dionysius, which comes from Nietzsche, of course. And I've often thought that Vishnu is more like Apollo and Shiva is more like Dionysus uh, in the sense that Dionysus is the god of, of drunkenness and, and ecstasy, um, whereas Vishnu is, is a more sober deity, uh, uh, sorry, Apollo is more sober deity, uh, god of reason and so on. And that's paralleled with Vishnu and Shiva. Vishnu is, um, is, 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 is law and um, harmony and um, um, a god of more control, perhaps. And Shiva is a, is a god of, of excess and living on the edges of society. He, he um, in his mythology, he, he, uh, there's a story, he, he leaves his wife Parvati and he goes and hangs out with his, um, with his demonic hordes, his, his ganas, his, his friends. And, um, and, and they, um, they drink bang, they drink, he drinks um, intoxicating uh, um, a, a brew of, uh, of hashish and um, he, um, he's a god of excess. Um, he's also the family man as well. Uh, so there are these two sides to Shiva. So I think that Shiva becomes attractive to the tantric tradition because of his uh, personality in a sense, because of his transgressive dimensions. Um, and also his ferocious dimensions as Bhairava, so, and his associations with death. So to get enlightened or to become liberated, you have to come to terms with both the order and um, the order and beauty of life, but also with its horrific aspects and with, with death in particular. So death is the other side of life. And Shiva embodies these two qualities of, of affirmation of life, but also the negation of life in death. And he also embodies the idea of excess and ecstasy beyond reason and beyond language. That, that leads me into my, my last question. Um, because the way in which the Bhagavad Gita might operate in Tantrism has always sort of interested me. There's a lot in the Gita that seems to be uh, very much in line with a tantric attitude to towards external uh, experience, although, of course, within a, a, a detachment and so forth. But at one point, Krishna does reveal himself to Arjuna as death. Um, and, and this is, I think, an important epiphany uh, for or theophany for Arjuna in, in that context. How does the Gita operate then in the Tantric tradition? I think Abhinavagupta wrote a commentary um, on the Gita and, and drew some of his um, metaphysics or presented some of his metaphysics through uh, that dialogue of Arjuna and, and Krishna. So how, how does that work? Yes, that's it. I think there are indeed those parallels. Indeed, in chapter 11, Krishna is, is, does call himself death, I am time, and he's the destroyer of worlds and so on. Very much akin to Shiva. Now, um, I think Abhinavagupta there's a, writes a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita on the Kashmir rendering of it. I think it's, it's some slight differences to the to the um, uh, critical edition, but um, I think this just bears witness to the importance of that text, the, the way that text had become pan-Indian or pan-Hindu, and. It had become a terribly important text. So, in a, in a sense, Abhinavagupta had to write a commentary on it, had to sort of colonize it with his Shaiva worldview, um, because it was, of course, written long before the, the rise of the dominance of Shaivism. Uh, so, in, in a sense, he writes that text, I think, the commentary, to um, bring the Bhagavad Gita within the realm of his Shaiva understanding. But apart from that one uh, commentary, I, I'm speaking of uh, ignorance here, really, but I don't know of any other commentary on the Bhagavad Gita from a Shaiva perspective. I'm not sure if Shrikanta wrote one, 
Um, I'd have to check, but I think I mean Avogadro is the exception to the rule. Uh, uh, sorry, is the um, is the only um, Shiva appropriation of the Bhagavad Gita that we have. Um, so I think conceptually they are similar, but I think the Shaiva tradition, on the whole, apart from that commentary by I mean Avogadro, seems to have ignored um, Vaishnava sources. I see. Um, interesting. Yeah. Um, well, those were, that I, th I think exhausts my questions. Before the interview, we were talking a bit about one of your colleagues who, who might be searching for the possibility of a Christian Tantra. A lot of what you've said made me think of, of certain aspects of the Christian tradition. The, the idea, for example, that some of the Tantric uh, texts are written in poor Sanskrit this is very much the case for the gospel, the antinomialism of Jesus, where he routinely sort of transgresses Mosaic law as, as laid out. Um, and, and also a lot of theology that's been coming through mainly from Russia, emphasizing the figure of Sophia, because God's wisdom in the Bible is, is a woman. She's presented as a woman in Proverbs. Um, and she is the means by which God seems to create the world. She was there from the foundation of the world. So she's the means of exteriorizing the world a lot like Shakti. So that's not a question. That's just some thoughts that, that kind of occurred to me as we were, uh, as I was listening to you. Uh, well, yes, I, I would, I would concur with that. I think that, uh, Pragna or Shakti and, uh, Sophia, there are strong parallels there. And, um, there, there are striking parallels in these traditions, and, and you, uh, whether um, there's a sort of perennial philosophy here, I would hesitate to, to make that claim at the moment, but um, there are certainly striking parallels in, in these traditions. So I do, I do believe in the possibility and the importance of comparative religion. And speaking of um, tantric um, Christianity, I always think of, of uh, William Blake as a sort of Christian tantrist in a sense. and. Um, his idea that I was only reading this morning that um, um, e energy is eternal delight. Um, so that strikes me as a very uh, Christian tantric sentiment. Absolutely, yeah. And 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 as you were sort of uh, drawing that the connection between Shiva, Dionysus, Vishnu, Apollo, um, you could interpret a lot of Blake in in terms of bringing Dionysus back in the idea that evil has been conceptualized as energy and as dynamism. In fact, the dynamic and the demonic share their etymology. And Blake is saying, I think in Proverbs uh, from hell, that, you know, you have to, you have to bring energy back in, you can't pathologize dynamism as such, and that this is something that perhaps has occurred. Um, so yeah, there, there's definitely some Dionysian or tantric uh, uh, aspect to, to Blake. In fact, I would say, it's 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 really what what seems to guide a lot of his poetry. Um, I would completely agree. Yes, he's got, I mean, in the marriage of heaven and hell, um, he he starts that there's reason on the one hand, and there's which is associated with good, and there's energy on the other, which is associated with bad, and and he wants to bring uh, heaven and hell together. He wants to bring uh, energy and reason together, um, and this is vital and important for human well-being and. Uh, human understanding and realization of, of humanity's deeper nature. Absolutely. And, and the, the fact that he uses marriage, the conjugal metaphor, um, again, is, is, is interesting because of not just the tantric dimension, but because it draws on the Christian tradition, the idea that the church is the bridegroom, um, uh, the bride, excuse me, in Christ the bridegroom, uh, yes. which is very much a tantric image, interestingly. Yes, indeed. Uh, yes, there's a whole history of a Christian mysticism on this, of course, the uh, route mystique, the uh, bride mysticism, and so on, from uh, Bernard right the way through. Uh, yes, I, I think that, that is right. So there are very strong parallels in these traditions, which you can trace through. And um, yeah, it's probably probably time for us to, to develop um, more theoretical reflection on the implications of these traditions for, um, for the modern world, in a way. I agree. I agree. And, and figuring out whether it comes from something that is perennially part of our psyche so that we keep coming up with these images for a reason or, or whether there's some uh, genealogical connection in terms of 
the tradition having gotten crossed over at some point. I, I would argue probably for the former, even if the latter is true. In other words, that there is something psychologically inbuilt about these these images. I, I think I would agree with you, and uh, I th there, there, there could be historical crossovers, but even if there are, I think that there are, are structural parallels there, which are rooted deeply in the nature of, of human beings, uh, who we are. And in a way, the language of these traditions, we're, we're always restricted by, by the horizon of possibility of the culture and what was known at the time. Um, and but, but now we, we, we know so much more about the, um, the nature of the world and the nature of human beings as, as uh, biological entities. And I do sometimes wonder if the, um, these traditions, their pro-sociality and their um, the dynamism is rooted in something deep in our own hominin past, perhaps in our pro-sociality, uh, the way um, language sometimes covers that that, that those deeper resources of our um, of our creatureliness, in a sense, and so uh, perhaps these traditions are ways in which human beings could um, get back to or transcend their their limitation caused through um, caused through language, um, but integrating those deeper levels of our being uh, in, into into the linguistic creatures that we are. Um, Something like that, anyway. I, I agree completely. I, that's that's definitely a research horizon, at least, that I think um, you've staked out and, and that people listening might be uh, inclined to pursue. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time. We said an hour, and I think it's it's been just about an hour, maybe even a little longer. Um, thank you very much, again, for, for lending yourself to this interview. Inviting me to speak to you and your and um, and the listeners. Thank you. Not at all. Cheers. Thank you very much, sir.